Good morning and welcome to today's uh, session on uh, uh, understanding the prophetic. Let's pray and begin. I'll just say a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that uh, you are establishing us in your word, line upon line, precept upon precept. And Father God, we thank you that it is your word who builds, uh, which builds us up, O oh God. Uh, it is your word that, um, uh, Lord, causes us to arise in our faith. Uh, and Lord, even as we grow in our faith, we pray that, Lord, we will see your uh, mighty works in our lives, oh God. Father, we speak blessings upon every single student uh, on all the platforms and their families, uh, all the faculty, and we just commit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so today uh, we move on to chapter 3, which is about the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament. As we've been seeing, the prophetic ministry is not something new like a um, uh, 21st century discovery. Now, only now we started seeing prophets and they are prophesying. It's not like that. In the Old Testament, we have seen there are people whom God chose to prophesy. In the New Testament also, there was a, a move of the prophetic anointing. The first person who is called as a prophet in the New Testament, any guesses? Prophet, New Testament prophet. Correct. John the Baptist. Okay. So he is known as a prophet because this is what the Bible says about him in Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. If anyone is there, you can kindly read it. Luke chapter 1, verse 17. The spirit and power of Eliza to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the diso uh, disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay. So there you go. We look at John the Baptist as someone who carried the spirit and the power of Elijah. Who was Elijah? He was a prophet in the Old Testament. Now, uh, do you remember we studied uh, in the previous chapter about transference of anointing? So that's what this is talking about. The transfer of the anointing from a uh, prophet to John the Baptist. And it also tells us the purpose of that anointing. What does it say? the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. So that is something that God did through John the Baptist. Okay. Uh, when we study about the life of uh, John the Baptist, we, we use terms like he was the way maker. He was the way preparer. He carried the forerunner anointing because whatever he did, before Jesus prepared the hearts of people to receive Jesus. You, you remember he went around saying, repent, repent, uh, and then, you know, uh, turn to God. So that's what he did, preparing people for the, the work of salvation that the Lord Jesus was about to do. But when we consider um, John the Baptist, he doesn't seem like a typical Okay, he doesn't seem like a typical uh, prophet. You Like we don't see anywhere uh, where John the Baptist says, thus says the Lord, you know, I prophesy to you. He just did his work through the anointing which he carried. Okay, uh, so again, what comes to our minds is what we learned earlier, that even if there is a transfer of the anointing or an impartation of the anointing, what happens is the part that gets imparted is in line with the calling. So John the Baptist's ministry looks so very different from Elijah's ministry, signs, wonders, miracles. That was Elijah's ministry. But prepare the way for the Lord was John the Baptist's ministry. Anointing, same. Yeah, same anointing. But very different um, sort of outcome or a very different manifestation. Okay, uh, let's uh, quickly take Nina's question. Nina, did you have a question? I see your hand raised. 
yes. Uh, can you hear me, Pastor? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear yeah. you. Uh, just a little uh, clarification on John the Baptist. Uh -huh. uh, because, uh, G I mean, Jesus said, the, you know, the least in the kingdom of uh, God is greater than he. From oh. the point of view of that, I thought so he was really part of the old covenant in that sense. Yeah, or you're right. Uh, you're right. So that that's what uh, uh, that scripture implies. He's part of the old covenant. So um, the least in the kingdom is greater than he would refer to all the blessings that a new, new covenant believer has, you know, which are so much better than even John the Baptist because he comes under the old covenant. So, but that that uh, means that, but but as far as being a prophet is concerned, he's considered a New Testament prophet. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. I one second, let me see if I can. He is called as the last of the Old Testament prophets, as far as I remember. Yeah. Okay. Last of the Old Testament prophets. Prophet. That's the uh, name given to him. Um, yeah. Just that I I don't remember the scripture for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see if I can find it for you. Yeah, so uh, it is it is said that he is the last of the old covenant prophets. Luke, I think it's in Luke. Just a moment, Nina. I'm trying to locate uh, the scripture. OK, so there is one uh, uh, scripture in Luke 16, 16, yeah, which says the law and the prophets were until John. So law and prophets, as I said, uh, Jesus referred to the Old Testament as law and prophets. So it says law and prophets were until John. So then what comes after John is part of the, it comes under the new covenant. Is that okay, Nina? Okay, you're on mute, so. Yes, yes, thank you, Pastor. Okay, sure, sure, yeah, thank you so much. All right, so let's uh, move on now. So we've seen about John the Baptist and how um, he carried the prophetic anointing, but the anointing obviously looked so much so different from what the anointing of Elijah looked like. Now, coming to Jesus, uh, do we think that Jesus was a prophet? Why? <laughs> why? Why do you think Jesus was a prophet? He, he, he he okay, he prophesied. Okay, prophesying is fine. But why is he, how do you say that he's a prophet? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I accept. I'm accepting everything. Give me the most solid answer. All the answers are correct only. But why are we calling him a prophet? When we say prophet, what is the difference between someone who prophesies and someone who is a prophet? Huh? What Deuteronomy 18.15? Yeah, Moses said, correct. But give me a confirmation from the New Testament. 
that Jesus is a prophet. Fivefold ministry, okay. Fivefold ministry. Huh? Correct. Everything is correct. But why is he a prophet? When we say he is a prophet, what are we saying? We are saying that he is in the fivefold ministry, right? How can we say that? That's my question. How can we say that he is in the fivefold ministry? It's it's what? It's not the material. <laughs> it's not the material. Okay. He did everything, but how do we confirm that he was in the office of a prophet? Ah, follow me. So you're all students of scripture and, uh, uh, you know, Interpreting scripture. Yeah, but would that would that make uh, somebody a prophet? Okay, very simple answer. Jesus called himself a prophet. So when Jesus is confirming that he is a prophet, then we have to accept it, right? Got it. So he confirmed that he's a prophet. He was moving in the prophetic. That's what all of you are saying. I agree with you. Um, but you remember we talked about the progression. When we just prophesy, it doesn't make us a prophet. Being a prophet is what? I, I, we shared one, uh, one term. What does a prophet carry? Anointing, yes. One more, very, very important uh, phrase is there. Governmental authority. Okay. So when we keep saying that somebody is prophesying, that's fine, but it doesn't mean they are carrying governmental authority or governmental responsibility so when jesus himself is saying that a prophet is not honored you know in his own uh, house he's saying i am a prophet i'm carrying governmental authority that is in mark chapter 6 verses 4 to 6 where jesus calls himself a prophet yeah 6 verse 4 to 6 yeah, wherever he has stated that uh, he is a prophet. Okay. As long as all those passages are confirming that Jesus is saying, I am a prophet. Okay. Now, in addition to that, you're right. There were prophetic words which were spoken by the um, early, like the Old Testament uh, fathers, like Moses. He said, another prophet will come. Uh, and, uh, you know, he will be the fulfillment, right? Like uh, ultimately of what God wants to do. Um, and we see people when they saw the Lord Jesus coming, uh, there was a confirmation that, hey, this is a prophet. This is a prophet of God. When he moved uh, in the prophetic anointing, that also showed that he was carrying the prophetic anointing. So through all these things, we recognize that the Lord Jesus was a prophet okay there were many manifestations in and through his life that revealed that he had the prophetic gift as well okay now let's move on let's look at um, the early church there are examples i'm not going into those examples if you recall uh, the woman at the well a samaritan woman didn't jesus prophesy yeah he prophesied to her and uh, you know he said that he revealed the, the condition of her life. That is prophetic anointing. When we consider Nathaniel, Nathaniel was uh, 
uh, sitting under the tree, Jesus saw him and he said, here is a man without any guile. How can somebody do that unless the prophetic anointing is moving them? Or somebody who looked at, Jesus looked at Peter. And Peter at that time was so raw. He was not uh, strong in the Lord and all that. But Jesus looked at him and said, hey, you are going to be the rock. So all this is part of what prophetic anointing. If you go to uh, Matthew 24, you find that Jesus is talking about the end times. He's talking about nation will rise against me. Like this is all serious prophecy about uh, um, what is coming up. Obviously, he's flowing through the prophetic anointing. But he himself mainly confirmed that he is that prophet. And uh, uh, we have other other passages as well. So we are quite clear. Jesus was a prophet. Now let's come to the early church. Okay. So in the early church, we know how the church was born. Uh, uh, they were waiting, as God told them, for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. 120 people were waiting in the upper room and then it happened. When they were in prayer, the Holy Spirit came upon them uh, as a, a rushing mighty wind and they began to speak in tongues. Okay, so that was the first uh, instance which we term as the birth of the church. So that's where the church was born. From that point onwards, we see the church is growing, growing in numbers, growing in um, uh, you know it, the demonstration of God's power. So it's growing in every way. Persecution happens. But in the midst of all this, how does the prophetic anointing look? in the early church? That's the question that we are asking. So we see that the power of God was always there, right? Uh, because we see people like Stephen, uh, Philip, they were all moving in signs, wonders, and miracles. So the church believers themselves are moving in signs, wonders, and miracles. When we go back to people like Elijah, Elisha, the prophetic anointing was connected with miracles. Isn't it? So we find that uh, even volunteers like um, Stephen and Philip, they demonstrated miracles through their lives. And as we keep going on, we find that there are prophetic teams that arise. So this is in the book of uh, Acts, Acts chapter 11. Uh, over there, we, we read that there were a set of prophets who came to the church in Antioch. So Antioch was a branch church of, um, uh, like, branch church, uh, I, I don't know if we can say Church of Jerusalem, but there were a lot of branch churches because people had spread all around and the churches had been started. So from the Jerusalem church, a team of prophets came to the church of Antioch. And part of that team is a very well-known prophet by the name of Agabus. Have you heard of this person, Agabus? So the uh, book of Acts confirms that he was a prophet. So it's not that you know he was prophesying al alone, but he was a prophet. He came and he spent time in the church of Antioch. And that was one of the ways uh, to actually equip the leaders and the believers of Antioch. So you can see that a prophet is going to strengthen the church, to strengthen the work of the ministry in uh, one of the churches. So let's keep moving on. We find that when uh, this kind of an equipping was done, see, already the church of Antioch had uh, teachers of the word. You had people like Barnabas, uh, people like Paul, who were spending their time, who were uh, training the people, raising them up. So teaching was already going on. But later, who came? Agabus and a team of prophets from the church of Jerusalem came, spent time in um, Antioch. And then we read in Acts chapter 13, the scripture says, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. So what happened after a prophet came or a team of prophets came to the church? Suddenly, after a couple of years, like two to three years, there are prophets in the church. 
so the the prophetic anointing the way we understand this it was stirred up people began to understand more of it and slowly now people are moving in the prophetic and even prophets are, are prophets have arisen in 3 years 2 to 3 years there are prophets in the church of antioch okay so we see the importance that the early leaders placed on prophetic ministry even in the church there are prophets now it was kind of normal nothing so uh, new so we will see that they have the fivefold ministry happening like a team you have the apostles uh, you have the uh, prophets you have the teachers you have the pastors you have the evangelists they're all working together so that is the picture of the early church so today when we talk about uh, having fivefold ministry in our churches it's nothing new it was already happening how did it happen in the church of antioch earlier there were only teachers but a prophet came a team of prophets came they ministered and there must have been the stirring up of the anointing the teaching about the prophetic and then you have it in 2 to 3 years prophets have risen up in the church okay so that's how it took place now as we keep looking at uh, um, the book of acts there'll be other names also that are mentioned about with regard to prophecy uh, people like um, silas judas these were all in the prophetic ministry and they were prophets in the church of jerusalem and they went to strengthen other churches and later on in uh, acts chapter 21 there is this uh, record of philip and his daughters now philip he he is an evangelist but he had four daughters who were virgins but they were moving in the gift of prophecy so the, all four of them they prophesied the bible says so then what is our understanding <laughs> we go back to um, acts chapter 1 verse 8 where it says and you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in jerusalem judea samaria and to the ends of the earth and then you go to acts chapter 2 where the holy spirit was poured out and uh, peter stood up and you know he uh, made that sermon in which he said your your sons and daughters right so it was given the power of the spirit was given to uh, both the genders in the book of acts itself acts 21 you see that the daughters of philip were prophetic they were flowing in the prophetic gift okay so uh, these are all about prophets and uh, prophecy in the book of acts we also observe that uh, when it came to prophesying the problems that paul is going to face paul was headed towards jerusalem and what was going to happen to him he was going to be caught uh, by by the romans and then he would be imprisoned uh, so this was prophesied by agabus to paul uh, not just if you notice how uh, the prophecy came to paul it came a couple of times a few people told him again and again paul don't go there you're going to get into trouble and agabus was one of the main persons to tell paul he took paul's belt he bound himself and he said you know uh, he he whose belt this is he is going to be bound so even agabus prophesied but paul knew that it was just part of his ministry he can't avoid getting into uh, you know trouble so he has to go towards jerusalem even though he knew it's going to happen he went ahead and uh, we know right that he got caught and then he was imprisoned went into a couple of trials after that so in the early church were there prophets yes it was common it was normal people were prophesying it was common it was quite normal um and yeah so that that is about prophecy in the early church 
Now coming to the writings of Apostle Paul, we read about the prophetic gift um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Excuse me, there is a listing of nine gifts of the Spirit, one of which is prophecy. So in the churches, was there encouragement to prophesy? Yes. Because Paul is writing about it and he's explaining about the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues. That means it was practiced and it was encouraged. Uh, now, the most basic scripture for all of us regarding prophecy is 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. If there is anyone at that passage, can you please read it? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Uh, which version did you read? Since? NIV. Okay. NKJV. Can some. Okay. He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So when we speak in tongues, who do we speak to? Who, who do we speak to when we speak in tongues? That's the question. God. Where do we see that scripture? Yeah. He who speaks in a tongue speaks to God. Where does where do you see that? First Corinthians fourteen three is prophecy. Correct. It's just in the previous verse. So I want us to notice that. In verse 2. Okay. Just see that. No, it's there. Right there. It says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. That's about tongues. 3 is, But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation and comfort to men. So when we speak in tongues, we are speaking to God. When we are prophesying, we are speaking to the people, to men. Now, um, what what is what are the what is edification, exhortation, comfort? We'll again come to it in detail. We'll look at it. But for right now, edification simply means strengthening. Strengthening. So if I want to strengthen myself, which gift? If I want to strengthen myself spiritually, which gift should I operate in? Yeah, tongues. Because when we speak in tongues, we edify ourselves. Okay, But if we want to strengthen the church or strengthen the body of believers, then which gift should we operate? Prophecy. That's what it says. When we prophesy, we speak edification. Meaning strengthening, spiritual strengthening of people happens when we prophesy. Edification, that is the meaning. Second, exhortation. Exhortation means encouragement. So when people hear what God is saying, encouragement comes to us. So that is exhortation. Third is comfort. Comfort is um, like finding peace. Uh, and uh, you know uh, we'll we'll come to it later. Actually, the the word there, like comfort, when we understand it, it means speaking tenderly, softly, with compassion. When we hear from God, sometimes we sense that we feel so comforted that God is speaking to us. So when we prophesy, what are we doing? This is how you describe simple gift of prophecy. What should it do? It should edify, exhort, and comfort. That's what it's supposed to do. 
so when we prophesy we all prophesy right supernatural uh, our prayer times otherwise also we prophesy what should it do edify exhort comfort so it's like you can sort of put it through the test we prophesy is it really edifying strengthening them encouraging them bringing comfort to the hearts of the people if yes okay fine it falls in the category of prophecy first corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3 okay don't forget first corinthians 14 verse 3 that's about prophecy um and what does verse 4 say yeah correct that's exactly what we were discussing till now it's quite clear isn't it yeah yes sir uh, prince correct it is so see i am saying simple gift of prophecy you, do you remember the progression we said simple gift of prophecy grace gift of prophecy based on romans chapter 12 then we said office of a prophet so uh, when it comes to simple gift of prophecy we are discussing about all of us as believers flowing in prophecy so there we may not find those many warnings judgments we can sometimes sometimes yeah but mostly people who are flowing in the prophetic office it tends to be a lot more for them like warnings judgments and how to release it uh, with that authority so they tend to do more of that okay fine yeah uh oh jackin has answered a question here yeah thank you uh, jackin so what we'll do is we'll um, probably stop right here and then we will continue in the next class we are going to study about the progression a little bit more so just now we said simple gift grace gift and uh, the ministry of a prophet so all of this is in the new testament we took it from paul's writings so we have to look at the passages where he mentions these things and form a good foundation before we move on to other things so we'll move on to other things and we will study about uh, how is the prophetic released next okay how is it released what are the uh, common ways in which the prophetic is released uh, so we will at that point we will talk about the prophetic word you know how the word comes forth and uh, it does what god wants to do so i'm just going to stop here but if you have any queries anything that you want to discuss we can pick it up okay we are quite clear i think oh, oh yes sir meena please uh nina did you want to say something uh, no sorry by i think oh, that had by mistake yeah so. okay 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 sure okay all right so then let's uh, wrap up our class and i request one of us to pray either online on campus either one of us okay nikhil pray for now so we thank you for this day for this time lord we worship you we praise you lord as we learned about your word lord jesus help us to understand deeply so we can learn your word lord jesus thank you for teaching us through nature ma'am in jesus name i pray amen and thank you and uh, yeah uh, we'll connect the next class on friday <laughs> thank you bye thank you